Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Before I get to today's poem, which is by Phyllis McGinley, and is a, it's a perfect poem for the beginning of June, I wanted to remind you about our poetry memorization contest here on The Daily Poem. Remember, you can memorize 12 lines of your favorite uh, American folk song, a uh, piece of, say, Native American poetry, um, so, something of that, of that ilk, something of that kind of, of verse. Memorize 12 lines, post the recitation on social media, and then add the hashtag TDP contest. So uh, hashtag TDP contest. And then on June 15th, we'll be choosing winners from each of the different age groups. So again, don't forget about that. Today's poem is by, as I said, Phyllis McGinley. She was an American author of children's books and poetry. She lived from 1905 to 1978. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 1961. Her poetry is um, uh, light verse, uh, specializing often in humor, satire, and unlike many of the popular poets who I have read on this podcast, she actually focuses much of her work on suburban life as opposed to rural or agrarian life, which for whatever reason uh, has been focused uh, m- focus more, uh, not really on purpose, on this podcast. But this poem is called June in the Suburbs. Seemed like a good poem for, uh, for June 1st. It goes like this. Not with a whimper, but a roar of birth and bloom this month commences. The wrens a gossip at her door. Roses explode along the fences. By day the chattering mowers cope with grass decreed a final winner. Darkness delays. The skipping rope twirls in the driveway after dinner. Through lupine-lighted borders, now for winter bones, Dalmatians forage. Costly, the spray on apple bough. The canvas chair comes out of storage. And rose-red golfers dream of par, and class-bound children loathe their labors. While pilgrims touring gardens are cold to petunias of their neighbors. Now from damp loafers nightly spills the sand. Bridges lodge their lists with plumber and cooks devise on charcoal grills the first burnt offerings of summer. Back in 2008, uh, in the Sunday Book Review of the New York Times, Ginia Belafonte wrote an essay, this is actually from Christmas Eve 2008, uh, called Suburban Rapture, and it talks a lot about Phyllis McGinley. And I wanted to read a few different snippets because I think that, um, well, first of all, because they reference this poem in particular, but also because I think that it helps unpack her value as a poet and her, and her influence, her lasting influence. So I'm not going to take any credit for what I'm going to read today, um, except for the fact that hopefully I can read. So here are a couple of passages from this essay. And again, it's by Ginia Belafonte in the New York Times Sunday Book Review from December 24th, 2008. And the essay is called Suburban Rapture, if you want to read the whole thing. So I'm just going to jump around a few spots here. Quote, a devotee of convention in nearly every aspect, McGinley committed herself to form, which during the high moment of the confessional poets seemed anachronistic enough to count as new fashioned. McGinley's light verse sought to convey the ecstatic peace of suburban ritual the delight in greeting a husband, in appointing a room, in going to the butcher. Anticipation pervades her work, the feeling of something quietly joyful about to happen. Beloved friends coming for dessert, perhaps, as in these lines from June in the Suburbs, through lupine-lighted borders now, for winter bones Dalmatians forage. Costly, the spray on apple bough, the canvas chair comes out of storage. The poem is from The Love Letters of Phyllis McGinley, a slim volume published in 1954 that went into seven printings in hardcover, eventually selling close to 150,000 copies. Seven years later, McGinley, who died in 1978, received the Pulitzer Prize for, for poetry for Times Three, which spanned her work over 30 years. In his foreword, W.H. Auden praised her dexterous, unostentatious rhyming and found in her familiar sensibility, in her familial sensibility, a likeness to Austin and Wolf, yet also a singular accessible voice. I start a sentence, the poetry of Phyllis McGinley is, and there I stick, he wrote, for all I wish to say is, is the poetry of Phyllis McGinley. Then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Quote, the occasion for McGinley's appearance on the cover of Time in June 1965 signaled a new chapter in her career, this time as a reluctant polemicist. For years, she had been out earning Hayden, 
her husband, a communications officer at Bell Telephone. She sold her poems, but also children's books and women's magazine essays that paid tribute to thrift, child rearing, house hunting. The fervor around the feminine mystique in which Betty Friedan dismissed McGinley as one of the housewife writers had prompted McGinley's publisher to persuade her to compile the pieces of the collection. The resulting book, Sixpence in Her Shoe, was published in 1964 and became a bestseller despite its neo-Victorian tone. A liberal arts education is not a tool like a hoe or an electric mixer, McGinley wrote, dismayed at the world she thought was conspiring to make women feel as though any acquired erudition would be wasted in a life of rifling through uh, recipe cards. It is a true and precious stone which can glow as wholesomely on a kitchen table as when it is put on exhibition in a jeweler's window or bartered for bread and butter, she wrote. She went on to dismiss the already benighted suggestion that Bryn Mawr was a threat to what ought to get done in a kitchen. Surely the ability to enjoy Heine's exquisite melancholy in the original German, she wrote, will not cripple a girl's talent for making chocolate brownies. McGinley's point an eternally divisive one was clear. A woman who enjoyed herself as a wife and mother should not submit to imposed ambitions. And then one step ahead here at the very end of this essay. In a poem called The 532, a poem about a woman meeting her husband at a train, she proved again that she seemed to find roses where so many others were turning up crabgrass. She said, If tomorrow my world were torn in two, blacked out, dissolved, I think I would remember as if transfixed in unsurrendering amber, this hour best of all the hours I knew. Larchmont, Connecticut, was lovely, but after a time McGinley moved on, all the way to Weston, Connecticut, and she relished it just as much. So I wanted to just share those thoughts on Phyllis McGinley with you, um, and for the sake of time I won't say anything more about them, but I do think that they open up um, poems like June in the Suburbs, they open up the, the, the sort of mission, the vocation of Phyllis McGinley and her poetry. So if you're interested, check out that review. Um, it's over at the New York Times Sunday Book Review. If you just Google New York Times Sunday Book Review Phyllis McGinley, it should, should pop right up there at the top. So one more time, June in the Suburbs by Phyllis McGinley. Not with a whimper, but a roar of birth and bloom this month commences. The wrens a gossip at her door. Roses explode along the fences. By day the chattering mowers cope with grass to create a final winter. Darkness delays. The skipping rope twirls in the driveway after dinner. Through lupine lighted borders now, for winter bones Dalmasons forage. Costly, the spray on apple bough. The canvas chair comes out of storage. And rose-red golfers dream of par, and class-bound children loathe their labors, while pilgrims touring gardens are cold to petunias of their neighbors. Now from damp loafers nightly spills the sand. Bridges lodge their lists with plumber, and cooks devise on charcoal grills the first burnt offerings of summer. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back on Monday with another poem for you.